Welcome to Old Fashioned Finance, the podcast that mixes cocktails and high finance. I'm your host, Jason Demland, and I am joined as always and in the future by my good friend and fellow money muddler, Caleb Frankert. Jason, can a podcast about finance be entertaining? Not without alcohol. Well, all right, let's mix it up. Fist bump. High five. We're doing it again. It's another episode (laughs) of the podcast show. Caleb, how have you been? Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty, pretty good. What's the news, man? What's new? (laughs) Uh, well, we got a puppy dog over the weekend. That's Tell me new. about the puppy. <laughs> My kids wanted a puppy. We thought we were going to get one and it fell through. And I said, all right, I'm going out and I'm going to get a puppy. And I did on Saturday morning. They love it. And I love it. And I forgot how hard puppies can be. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of puppy did you get? This is fun. A Yorkie Palm Iranian mix, uh, also known as a Yorkie Palm or a Porky, which I think is funny. Porky is better. <laughs> My wife had a Pomeranian for years. You remember Spike. Yeah, I remember Spike. Spike the Killer. Yes. Uh, he was tough, man. Yes. You know, he definitely punched up a, a weight class or two. He tried. He had a lot of attitude. He was definitely a Napoleon type. So he's yeah. uh, this dog's got that in him, but he's also got Yorkie, so he's also very, very affectionate. And I got him because I thought he'd be a great dog for my wife, and this little guy will not leave my side. So it's your dog. You got yourself a dog for the family. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess. All right, that's cool, man. I'm so going to get a dog fun. someday. Yeah, you almost did this I weekend did. too. <laughs> it just didn't work out perfectly. And if something doesn't, if it, I was feeling it right in the moment. I was like, we're doing it. We're going to dog. Right. We for a couple days in a row, you. Yeah, couldn't pick the dog up then. Now I'm totally cool. No, that's off. And I told you that was going to happen. You know, you might want to wait till summer. I'm realizing it was pretty dang cold out and we're taking the dog out every half an hour to try to potty train him i'm like dang should have done this in the summer when my wife and kids are at home stand out there in the freezing cold while you wait he's looking up at me like what the heck are we doing out here (laughs) practicing yeah practicing boy so it's fun that's exciting the kids are great i mean they're really excited so they it i don't know i felt like a hero for a weekend that's awesome we'll see if they like me this week (laughs) we're we're dog pro dog yeah very on this show they're good buddies uh i'm very happy for you it's good to get a get a little puppy. Well, how's how's your weekend? All right. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't have to wear my sling anymore. Awesome. I'm recovering. Yeah, you had great news. By I'm going to be able to pitch in the pros again. I mean, for the first Funky time. Funky butt loving. Potentially. So that's good news. Uh, my labrum is healing better than anyone's labrum has ever healed in the history of labrum healing. More than the average 75 year old <laughs> who's having the same surgery as you. Yeah, you're healing yeah, faster. I'm beating them. So that was my <laughs> news from the weekend. It was good. That's exciting. Um, yeah. Well, I'm excited for today's episode, Caleb. I am too. We're going to talk about income taxes. Two kinds. <laughs> the, the not good, awesome kind yeah. and the more good kind. And the one I can maybe look forward to, <laughs> although we haven't tried it yet. I hope that we can look forward. I'm looking forward to it now. Hopefully, after we drink it, we'll still look forward to it. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, we'll look forward to it again. More yeah. than we look forward to tax season, because as much as tax strategy can be fun and all of this stuff is really super interesting. I always feel just kind of anxious the first few months of the year. It's because of the IRS. Yeah. A tax, this getting nerdy about taxes, figuring out strategies is kind of kind of fun. Yeah. Kind of our jam. Yeah, tax avoidance is awesome. Yeah, now, yeah. I didn't say evasion. There's a big difference between avoidance and evasion. Yeah. Avoidance. You can work that tax code and still be okay. That's right. And we encourage working that tax code. But I think that it would be a lot more fun if there wasn't the IRS <laughs> hanging over your head. Well, we wouldn't have a tax code, which would be well, great. Well, it just wouldn't be enforced, well, right? I guess. Honor, Honor system. Honor system. Yeah. Why not? Okay, I'm well, for it. Let's see how it works out. It could work. I don't know. Before we talk about actual income taxes, which would be really, really helpful for all of you out there, Let's talk about something that will be even more helpful for all of you out there during tax season. Yeah, if, if this goes as planned, this will help us get through tax season, hopefully. What are we drinking today, Caleb? Well, this is the income tax cocktail, and I got this one. I, I mean, we talked about the episode. Thought it's a good time to do taxes. What about that income tax cocktail we keep seeing? So yes. I thought it was maybe a newer drink. It's not. It's been around for a long time, uh, but I'll let you get into the history uh, so what we're drinking specifically here, well, I'll pull out the old Savoy cocktail book because it was in there in 1930, right? Yeah. There it is. The income tax cocktail 
kind of a weird order that they lay these ingredients out, but a dash of Angostura bitters, the juice of a quarter of an orange, one quarter French vermouth, one quarter Italian vermouth, one half dry gin, shake well and strain into a cocktail glass. I think maybe it'll be easier to go over this with like ounces like we normally do. Okay, and, and, yeah. Uh, rather than parts. Uh, so I did a ha- well, an ounce and a half of gin, three quarters of an ounce of Italian or sweet vermouth, three quarters of an ounce of dry or French vermouth, yeah. and one ounce of fresh squeezed orange juice. This is fresh. Squeezed right out of an orange. And a couple dashes because, you know, I always go heavy on Angostura yeah, bitters. Yeah, that's I like I like the bitters too. Let's, Neat. Let's try it out. All right, let's test. Cheers. Cheers. Hmm. Interesting. This is a martini. Yeah. <laughs> with a, orange juice. It's in a it. perfect martini with orange <laughs> juice. No, and we've said this before on the show. Perfect doesn't mean this is the perfect martini. No, no. It means equal parts we dry got, and sweet vermouth. Yeah. That, you're right. It's very martini-ish. But with that sweet with vermouth and juice. the little orange juice. Mm-hmm. Interesting. This is a Bronx cocktail, actually. With orange juice in it. Well, tell me a little bit about the history of this drink, Jason. Consulting again, David Wondrich's imbibe, the ultimate history of cocktails. Basically, is the Bronx cocktail. and But like other cocktails, people don't really know how the Bronx started. Mm-hmm. It just kind of came about. So Seems like a spinoff of a Manhattan. Remember the, yeah, the it's phase very where similar. everything... And all those little boroughs were coming yeah. up with their own drink. And there's the Toronto and there's... Probably the, the more Brooklyn. Cities. We did the yeah. Brooklyn. Was there another one that we did? Well, we've done Manhattan's. We've done a like lot of every those. other week. <laughs> so you know what? I'm not going to apologize for it. <laughs> the the Bronx took a long time to get popular, and I guess the Bronx did have orange juice in it. The Bronx had orange juice. Okay, and that's why people hated it, and it didn't <laughs> catch on. Orange juice was not acceptable mixer in cocktails. Lemon juice was. Yeah. Lime juice was. Yeah. But people weren't cool with orange juice, and and. It's because it dilutes it even more than lime and lemon do. It it takes over. Yeah. And it makes it a lot weaker tasting because you you don't taste it as much. It's probably why, the why vodka drink the yes. screwdriver is so popular. Like <laughs> and you can, the Harvey you, Wall banger. Yeah, you can yeah. taste no alcohol in those drinks. And Wondrich, Wondrich kinds of cites that. He, he, there's a blistering article against it or something that was really famous where a lady said that the orange juice just was really bad. The pop a play. Oh, Zoe Atkins in a 1913 play, uh-huh. Papa. Papa. Uh, really ribbed Papa. on it. Papa. The problem wasn't the gin or even the vermouth. It was, you guessed it, that darned orange juice. Mm. Except she. This is a family show. She was a potty mouth about it. <laughs> uh, so uh, Wondrich likes the Bronx with a fair amount of Florida sunshine in it, he says. And the Bronx was gin, French vermouth, Italian vermouth, two dashes of orange bitters, bar spoonful of orange juice, and a squeeze of an orange peel. How is this different? We have a lot more orange juice in there. Okay. I think, right? Squeeze of a, a bar spoon of orange juice? That's not much. No, it's, that's like a splash. And he put a little more in it. But this is a third gin, a third vermouth, and a third vermouth. Are those our proportions? Or would we be more ginny? We're real close. We're a little bit. We're, we're a half gin. Interesting. Yeah, uh, he said that the original Bronx was made with Plymouth gin. Okay. And he doesn't say anything about the income tax cocktail. Is it possible that Harry Craddock just stole the income tax <laughs> cocktail, or in, well, like, renamed the Bronx in his book? You know, I, I'm going to defer to David Wondrich in the history. Um, what I had read kind of said that the Bronx was a was a cocktail, a known commodity in the early 1900s, and I don't know that orange juice was always in a Bronx cocktail. Based on what I read, I, I think Difford's Guide is what I, I looked at. But they basically said there were a lot of variations of the Bronx, and one of them was adding orange juice, which became the income tax cocktail. Okay. So maybe they went retroactive and added orange juice to the regular Bronx. I don't I don't know. That could be. It really seems like it was a perfect martini. Yeah. Then somebody added some bitters. Basically. Then somebody added some orange juice. This, and it the, turned into this. Yeah. The income tax cocktail is a variation of the Bronx. There were a lot of different variations. This one stuck uh, for whatever reason. You know, I don't hate orange juice and cocktails. I got to be honest. I don't hate it. It's definitely a different taste experience. I thought it was really good in uh, some of the bourbon-based cocktails that we tried. Orange goes um, really well with bourbon. If, if you're a, a sweet tooth like I am, I, I think yeah. that's a pretty good combination. This is a little different because we've got gin, and I have we you know we like you said we're used to mixing lime or lemon. Yeah, in, uh, it's uh, weird. Which lemon overpowers, I think. You have to use very little yeah. when it's lemon. This orange juice 
I, you can taste the pininess of the gin coming through with the orange. That's dangerous because mm-hmm. you get really close to the the toothpaste and orange juice taste. Bit. And I, that's what I was really worried was going to happen. And then it got a lot more pleasant as I continued drinking. it. I think that the orange that I used, by the way, that I juiced... Didn't we talk about this? Did we not get regular oranges at the grocery store? This might be some kind of tangerine or something. Was it not a Valencia orange? I don't know. For juicing? But I think that's half of the fun. Yeah. <laughs> Using different oranges, like a blood orange might be really good in this. I don't know. I don't know. I it don't would know. be really muddy looking, but you know what? I, this isn't bad. I will finish this drink. If I were to drink this while doing my taxes, it would be a more pleasant experience. Yeah, I definitely agree. This will improve the mood while doing income taxes. Let's let's kind of intro the tax part of the the finance. This, this is this the podcast. work that tax code episode. Yeah. So let's I'm, get we're ready. We're going to say it a lot in this one. Remember Everyone, folks, work that tax code. <laughs> be prepared <laughs> to work that tax. So code. let's talk about it. It's tax time. Uh you hear that the, the you know the calendar turns and immediately you go, "Oh, taxes. Why, Jason?" I you, I know you mentioned it earlier. Well, the IRS has something to do with it. Why do we hate taxes yeah. so much? Uh, because only nerds love taxes. If you're Ned Flanders, it's January 1st and you go, "Up oh, the first of the year, better get a head start on those taxes, Nettie. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for the rest of us, we hate it because it means giving your money away by force. <laughs> Nobody likes being bullied into giving away their money, and that's kind of what's happening. It's for the greater good. We live in a civilization, so we're pooling our resources to buy things that may or may not be necessary for our civilization. Yeah. I think that's a lot of why we don't like to do it. Though. Or if you gave the the uh, IRS too much money throughout the year, it's a review. It's like it's like watching a tape of yourself getting beat up by that bully <laughs> at school. <laughs> oh, here's see, where he turned oh, me man. upside down and <laughs> shook out all of my lunch oh, money. Yeah. Look how much money I gave these people this year. You know how much yeah. milk I could have bought if those bullies <laughs> wouldn't have got me? All of it. <laughs> all of the milk. I think the worry of screwing up. Is a lot of it, too. There's a lot of pressure. You feel like if you make a mistake, you are going to you're, go to jail. You're going to pay dearly yeah. for that mistake. They have a lot of power. Yeah, um, and, and that usually means more taxes. Yeah. <laughs> so leaving some of the commentary about the uh, morality of taxes aside. No. Taxation is theft! <laughs> leaving some of that aside. This is why it's your responsibility to work the tax code. You have to work that you tax code. You have to work that tax code. You need Otherwise, to get as much of your own money back as possible. Yeah, and we need to clarify, tax avoidance is absolutely okay, and the IRS and our auditor will say tax avoidance is okay. It's not frowned upon. Tax evasion is a different story. Avoid all the taxes you can. Yes, do it legally. Yeah. If you are... Not paying taxes that you need to pay. You are doing the wrong thing. That's evasion. That is immoral, even though you think taxation is immoral. So you're you're not doing an immoral thing. Therefore, it's moral. These are the laws of the land. Yeah. Vote. Voting matters. Elections have consequences. You solve it there. Look, you owe it to yourself to avoid as much as you can in taxes. And if at the end of the day you decide that you didn't give enough. Right. They take donations. Yeah, if you're worried about not paying your fair share, you can just give you money. You can just give money to the IRS's cause. They don't like act like cause. they can do that. Yes, <laughs> I don't give to charity. I give to the IRS because I like how they distribute my money. Right. Go ahead and do that. But while the rest of us are avoiding as much taxes as we can, yeah. that's, that's what we're going to do. The other thing is forced deadlines. You have to do this. Yeah. You get into the, you know, I feel like after the holidays, calendar turns and now... Oh, no, taxes. I've got this deadline. And here in Ohio, it's just winter for the next few months. We don't have much yeah, to look forward to. There's nothing else to do. Might as well do taxes. Yeah. So I think there's that deadline, that imposed deadline that just makes us all nervous. Like it's yeah. it's hanging over our head all the time. I so. think a lot of it is, it is, if you, Caleb, have you ever read the tax code? <laughs> like, I <I'm>, Boy, <laughs> have I. <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah. And nobody understands all of it by themselves well jason you know that last year i didn't read any fiction or anything for fun really (laughs) right i I felt like i read my bible and the tax code yes why not yeah (laughs) to well i wanted to to better myself in both uh 
capacities. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to, to bring more value to clients. But my goodness, it is not entertaining reading. No. Um, it's it's confusing. And it and doesn't always make sense. When you read it, and you know, I think that when you try to clarify things, you talk to experts and you get conflicting ideas sometimes. How you interpret this tax code mm-hmm. is, is scary. And I think the biggest reason people hate taxes other than just having to pay is we're terrified of making those mistakes. So yeah. let's jump into the next segment here and talk a little bit, Jason, about some of those common mistakes that are made and how you can avoid them. I listed five. So I guess I, I'll throw some of these out there and let's Hit me with your top those. five tax mistakes. Everybody pay attention. By the way, this is in no particular order, but some of the most common, and I looked at some websites, some different, you know, I looked at IRS, I looked at Motley Fool, a lot of different financial websites out there. And there are quite a few of these that were constant on the list. Yeah. <laughs> there was one, it was like 29 common tax mistakes. That's too much. So we're going to just <laughs> There's try to There's actually way more common tax <laughs> there mistakes are, than that. that. We're well, going to go through five. Before I jump into the five, though, some of them were really, really surprising. Very common on a lot of lists was <laughs> misspelling your name. Yeah. <laughs> misspelling your dependents' names or putting the wrong social security numbers. Yeah. I mean... Getting your personal information <laughs> right is very important. It, it's like those standard standardized tests in school where the teacher's like, don't worry, if you get your name and birthday right, you automatically get 10 points. So you can't get a zero, (laughs) right? And then you just whiff on that. But people mess up Ah, on that all the time. It's one of the most most common uh, mistakes, just getting your information right, your basic information, not your tax information. So uh, (laughs) I I think the first one to look at here would be, and, and this is one we've talked about with our clients, we've talked about off record plenty of times, incorrect filing statuses. Yeah. You know, there are there's a a few different statuses that you can you can file single if Mm -hmm. you're single. If you're married, you have a couple of options. You can file joint like most do. You can do married married filing separately. You can do head of household. And then the qualifying widow or widow or widower is, is another one of the filing statuses that we can use. But I see in this one a lot, not necessarily that you're filing wrong, because usually if you're using a, a, a tax preparer, they might run these scenarios a couple of different ways and yeah. say, okay, hey, this year, I know last year we, we did married filing separately, but this year it makes more sense to, to file joint. The the call for that could be, well, you come out 50 bucks ahead this way versus this way. Yeah. Right? Jason, why is that dangerous? Why does that need a little bit more care and attention from a financial planning standpoint? Well, because filing your taxes, and I think we've said this before, when you are with a tax preparer and you're doing your taxes, you are looking at history. Mm -hmm. A tax preparer is a great historian. Usually they will look at all the stuff that happened and they will document it Mm -hmm. and it'll be accurate. That's their whole, that's their their whole jam. The IRS wants to get their tax money. The tax preparer wants to make sure things are right. If you just look at it that way and just look at the way to file to reduce taxes right now in the moment, you will neglect all the things in the future, even in the immediate future for the upcoming year. So married filing separately can ruin your, in, in that tax year that you're doing the taxes for, can ruin your options for IRA contributions. Yeah. You might not be able to make a deductible IRA contribution. You might not be qualified for a Roth IRA contribution. Yeah. It, well, let's, let's look at an example of that, right? Let's say you have a married couple who are under the Roth IRA, contrib- the income limits to contribute to a uh, Roth IRA, right? Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, maybe there's a dependent status or something, right? You know, you look at second marriages and shared custody and things like that. That's where I see it a lot of times. Sure. You know, it might be, you know, I'm claiming these children this year, but next year, you know, somebody else is claiming those children and that might affect my status. But like you said, you might, as a couple, be under that Roth contribution income limit. Right. But by filing married separate... Mm-hmm. You know, if you make more than ten thousand dollars, you're you're done. You can't make those Roth contributions. And I have right. seen, unfortunately, where a client just did what they normally did. They made the Roth contributions because realize you don't have to. You you can do that and fail to report that to your tax person, and it doesn't change the numbers. Right, right. You did it. You just if you get audited, you are in a lot of trouble. Yeah, like you're gonna have to pay penalties, and you're gonna have to undo it. And it's going to be a headache. Yeah. So you got to make sure that these filing status, the the status that you choose also line up with your financial planning goals, which obviously IRA contributions and things like that are a a huge part of that. And qualifying widow and widower, I think that's one that gets just kind of forgotten about a lot. Well, it's true. You You can file like you're still married for a couple of years. Take advantage of the death of your spouse. But yeah, you get that year and the next year. Yeah. There's generally still income from that spouse. 
Yeah, right? so absolutely. There's a reason for that. That's the biggest uh, one that jumps out to me on filing statuses is you can really you can make a decision that looks good based on uh, deductions and all that kind of stuff, and maybe it is more beneficial by a few bucks here or there, but you could yeah. be losing out big time on on your retirement plan. So another one I'm going to hit on, and we just talked about this with <laughs> somebody out front missing documents or not presenting all of the documents when you go to file. Yeah. Obviously, this is a, is a big one, right? You're, well, your tax preparer is a historian. If you don't give them all the facts, <laughs> yes. they're not going to get it right. right. And so this is really on you as the filer. Having a really good relationship with your tax preparer is really important here because they may know more. But yeah. are they going to know that you took continuing education that might be available for the American Opportunity Credit? Probably not if you told them, and unless you told them, unless right? you tell. Yeah, they're yeah. not going to know. Or did you go to school? Did you get a new mortgage? If you had a new kid, <laughs> right. uh, those kinds of things. You need to make sure all of your information is update up to date, or your tax preparer. And most of the tax preparers right now, until through April, they don't yeah. have a life. They, right. they are not a functioning human being anymore. They are all tax code <laughs> all the time. And by the way, right after <laughs> April 15th, they're not a human being, not, not a reachable human being for a couple months they either. They might be in, enjoying a few income tax cocktails <laughs> right, right. And, and blowing off some steam. So it's really incumbent on you to get all this stuff together. And unfortunately, and, and personally, I've seen that where the taxpayer is just grinding out tax returns and they don't get all yeah. of your information. And we don't know the tax code, regular people, uh, you and I, just Joe Public. So we just How go, can you work that tax code if you don't know that tax code? Well, I know the tax code <laughs> a lot better than the normal person, and we still it's still hard to communicate yeah. with a tax preparer to make sure they have all the documents that they need to get me all the deductions that I deserve, all the credits that I deserve, and to structure my filing in such a way that is most beneficial to me. Yeah. I think when it comes to documents, you don't want to file too early. Some people get out in front of it too early. Some people wait wait, uh, way too late. Right. And you might end up missing 1099s or there's some 1099s out there. Maybe some are only available online and some are being mailed to you. Realize that you're not going to have everything mailed to you in a pretty package and here's all you need to go to your tax preparer. It doesn't yeah. work that way. You need to have your W-2s, your 1099s. Maybe there's K-1s. 1098s. Yeah, don't forget. <laughs> what about interest from bank accounts? I know it doesn't sound like much, mm-hmm. um, but you could be missing out there. What if you have a health savings account and you've got contribution uh, information? Maybe your employer made some matches. That's all information that, that your tax preparer yeah. is going to need. IRA contributions. Maybe a building that you own burned down. Maybe you sure. got a big gift from someone. Maybe you won a car on a game show. There's yeah. a lot of tax documents Maybe you, had you should a debt be getting. forgiven. There's a yeah. lot of things uh, that, that really you can't, you can't miss it in your tax preparer at this time of the year, certainly, I, I, it, they'd be hard pressed to sit down and ask you all these, did you have any of this? Yeah. Did you have any of this? Nope. They get this bundle. They're going <laughs> to, what we're going to work into at the end of these common mistakes to avoid is how we can make sure we don't make yeah. those mistakes, how to maybe find and work with a good tax preparer. And also, yeah, you know, I know we're running a little short <laughs> on time, but how you can be a good client for your tax preparer. So next, this one, we really, the next few, we don't have to spend a lot of time on, but uh, incorrectly claiming deductions and adjustments, right? And you and I have seen this. We look at our clients' tax returns when they bring them in. <laughs> um, standard versus itemized deductions. This has changed a lot over the last few years yeah. with the uh, Trump tax cuts. A lot of people that used to itemize are now filing standard. <laughs> it, it, it saved me a lot of time. All on those my missing taxes. documents that we just talked about. They don't matter if you're taking the standard deduction. Well, almost for the most part. Documents. Well, <laughs> those matter a lot. Those, Never mind. They do time. still matter. Uh, I guess when we get to collecting receipts and that sort of thing and getting expenses, it won't matter. Well, what you need to make sure here is that you're not leaving money on the table, right? Itemizing yeah. is good if you've got a lot of true deductions. Right. But remember, the the, the standard deduction doubled. And, and that, that could change. 100 joint yeah. for 2021. 12,550. Don't forget at age 65, your standard deduction goes up a little bit Cha-ching. too. Or if you're blind, a lot of yeah. people don't know that. Right. 65 or blind, right? Yeah. Uh, who who would have known? Or you can the get tax both. Code is if you're, 60, you if you're 65 and blind, you can get both. But, you know, you might be leaving money on the table. All, uh, there's also a part of it where, you know, if you're doing itemized because you're going to get $100 more back that way, are you doing too much work, you know, when standard might be good enough? Yeah, probably. I have also seen people <laughs> who are really, really proud of their deductions and their charitable giving, and they fi- they f- itemize when they would be better off actually doing yeah, the standard deduction. I've seen that too. That's craziness. But if you are going to itemize, the other thing you got to watch out for, are some of these deductions not worth it? Am I raising any audit flags? Home office is a big one. If you're claiming a home office, 
boy, you better do that right. Because you better I'm telling understand. You, there is a separate pile for people doing yeah. home office. There are a lot of those kind of self-employed deductions that folks take because they just want more deductions. Yeah. I get it. You want your money back, but you better know <laughs> know what that says if you're going to try to work that tax code that way. Yeah. Or you're going to get audited. So I kind of alluded to this. Uh, another mistake is waiting to the last minute. We just talked about how overwhelmed tax preparers are right now showing up at their doorstep on April 10th. Yeah. And hoping that they catch something that you missed, it's probably a, a bad strategy. So uh, you're going to increase the likelihood of errors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not getting the right documents or not being able to get them in time when you realize you don't have them. Now, realize you can file an extension. Yeah, it's um, not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Everybody out there can file a six-month extension for no yes. reason whatsoever. Yeah, just because you didn't want to do it yet. But do you, you want know. all this hanging over your head until October? I don't. The last one is really big. We've talked about this, Jason, not staying up on changes. It seems to me over the last few years, the tax code has been changing a lot more frequently, has yeah. it not? Yeah. Um, so if you're not staying up on these changes, you can't rely on what you did last year or the year before to get you through because right. it might be different. Because you didn't read the Secure Act. You didn't read the Secure Act right. 2.0. You didn't read the CARES Act and whatever other eight ones I missed. you got a lot of work to do to catch up. So I Staying up on changes is huge if you're going to do it yourself. All of this, in my opinion, points to working with a qualified tax preparer, somebody that knows what the heck they're doing, maybe with some letters behind their names. That's really, yeah. really important because otherwise it's just like what we say about investing. Could you invest on your own? Probably, but it's most likely not going to be a great experience if you don't know this in and out. So Jason, in a minute or less, how can you find a good tax preparer and how can you be a good client for a tax preparer? I wish I knew. <laughs> uh, you got to find somebody that knows what they're doing. That works really hard. Their discovery process, how they get to know you is really, really important. How yeah. we like to work with folks, we don't prepare taxes here, is get to know people really good yeah. for years. Or and then, well. And then communicate... <laughs> And then communicate with their tax preparer on their behalf, or at least review. So they get their taxes prepared, we review them, then they get filed. Yeah. That is a good step there. But a way to be a great tax preparer's client is to make sure all of your personal info is gathered and up to date. Social security numbers for you and your dependents. Names. Addresses of <laughs> like investment property. Apparently that's hard for some people. Like, it, it, it is. Yeah. Like, I didn't know how one of my daughter's names were spelled until just recently. Awesome. Then, uh, there's an apostrophe. It's not my fault. I love you, Joe. Um... <laughs> Wait, I don't know what kid we're talking about. <laughs> I will tell you after the show. <laughs> okay. uh, collecting all of your tax documents that you need. Every 1099, every 1098. If you got that, usually you get emailed now. They come in the mail. Collect them in a giant pile. Think about your life. Anything that has changed this year, get that written down. Collect every receipt. If you're going to deduct your charitable contributions, you if it's more proof. than $250, you better be able to prove it. So get those. Unless you're not going to take an itemized deduction, then don't badger your church treasurer yeah. for a receipt when you don't, you're not even going to use it. But you might not know until you run the numbers both ways. That's true. You need to run the numbers. Meet with someone well before the deadline so you have time to do this But not right before way. February 1st. Right. <laughs> Jason, this was fun. Thanks That's for having great. a drink with us this week, folks. It's time to close out the tab. If you have a question or a topic you want addressed on the Old Fashioned Finance podcast, be sure to email us at speakeasy at oldfashionedfinance.com. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to share the show with someone you love or someone who needs a little money muddling themselves. You can stay up to date with all of the latest action by following us on Facebook and Instagram. Old Fashioned Finance is brought to you by Blue Jay Financial Group. That's bluejfg.com and produced by Pottery Studios. We've been your hosts, Jason and Caleb. Work that tax code. Work that tax code and cheers. And cheers. <laughs>Blue Jay Financial Group, LLC, Blue Jay, is a registered investment advisor registered with the state of Ohio. Registration does not imply a certain level of skill or training. The presence of this advertisement on this podcast shall not be directly or indirectly interpreted as a solicitation of investment advisory services to persons of another jurisdiction unless otherwise permitted by statute. Follow-up or individualized responses to consumers in a particular state by Blue Jay in the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation shall not be made without first complying with jurisdiction requirements or pursuant to an applicable state exemption. All verbal and written content on this presentation is for information purposes only. Opinions expressed herein are solely those of Blue Jay, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources and no representations are made by our firm as to other parties' informational accuracy or completeness. 
All information or ideas provided should be discussed in detail with an advisor, accountant, or legal counsel prior to implementation.